Takeda is focused on creating better health for people and a brighter future for the world. We aim to discover and deliver life-transforming treatments in our core therapeutic and business areas, including gastrointestinal and inflammation, rare diseases, plasma-derived therapies, oncology, neuroscience, and vaccines. Together with our partners, we aim to improve the patient experience and advance a new frontier of treatment options through our dynamic and diverse pipeline. As a leading values-based, R&D-driven biopharmaceutical company headquartered in Japan, we are guided by our commitment to patients, our people, and the planet. Our employees in approximately 80 countries and regions are driven by our purpose and are grounded in the values that have defined us for more than two centuries. Please visit Takeda.com for more information. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Enlorm podcast series that focuses exclusively on issues pertaining to the nanorare patients that we serve. I'm Stan Crook. I'm chairman and CEO of Enlorum, and I'm your host on the podcast series. And today we have a very interesting and special guest, Dr. Dan Curran. Dan is head of the rare disease and hematology uh, therapeutic area unit at Takeda. And of course, Takeda is one of the largest of the pharmaceutical firms that has its uh, beginnings in Japan, but now is a very much a multinational company. So Dan, welcome. Thanks so much for making the time for us. Oh, it's my pleasure, Stan. Thanks for having me. I'm glad we were finally able to schedule this. I know it took a while. Yeah, we've had a little bit of trouble, but uh, I think uh, I, I think this will prove to be very worthwhile for our folks. So um, before we actually get into how you came to be where you are, I think there are some questions that um, many folks in patients and parents of rare disease uh, patients um, have a lot of confusion about, and I think maybe you can help them. So I, I think pretty much everybody involved knows that what the FDA and the EU definition of rare disease. But I wonder, in, in a large company like Takeda, operationally every day, how do you, how do you define rare disease at, when you're competing for, for resources? Yeah, thanks, Dan. I think it's a, it's a really interesting and very, very good question because I think, you know, in our industry, different um, companies, different individuals define rare diseases in a, in a very different fashion. Uh, you know, at Takeda, we actually have, I would say, two distinct definitions of, of rare diseases. Within the, the area that I, I lead, the rare genetics and hematology therapeutic area, we, we define our rare diseases via genetics. So the presence of a either loss of function or gain of function mutation in the genome of a, of a patient, which then leads to a constellation of, of symptoms. And that's how we think about you know, rare diseases defined by a genetic basis. Um, however, we also think about it across other disciplines within Takeda in, in development and discovery as an epidemiologic phenomenon. So indications or diseases where the prevalence or the incidence of that disease is lower than a certain figure uh, is how we typically define and think about quote unquote rare or, or orphan diseases. So when we think about rare diseases at Takeda, actually probably almost half of our portfolio of medicines in development is focused on a rare disease, whether that be a, a monogenic loss of function or gain of function condition, or a epidemiologically defined prevalence or incidence for rare diseases. Well, that's fascinating. And uh, so in your unit, basically you're an industrial scale uh, mutation directed drug discovery program. Correct. That's important for me to hear because I've been telling everyone that NLARM is the first industrial scale mutation directed R&D program in the industry. <laughs> now I have to change what I say, uh, but that's, that's fascinating. I suspect that that is not the same in a lot of other uh, large, large, large pharmaceutical companies. Uh, it's out, uh, and so that's your unit. And then you have another a part of the organization that, ca that really addresses what uh, based on prevalence of one sort or another. Yeah, and in some cases, you know, for instance, in in oncology, we will define you know a rare disease via a particular you know mutation, if you will, as the somatic mutation 
that leads to you know a particular oncologic indication. Similar in, in neuroscience, we look very much at quote unquote common disorders that are known to have at least in some sense a genetic component to it. But in those areas, it's definitely more an epidemiologic incidence based definition of rare. Yeah. So when at, at some point to a, a acquire the necessary resources to move from a novel idea to, to a drug, you have to compete for resources. And I'm fascinated to hear that that about half the drugs in development at, at Takeda, if I understood it correctly, are, are targeted to rare diseases. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I think that's not likely the case in a lot of other larger companies. Uh, how, do you, how does that come to be justified economically? Yeah, that, it's, a, it's always a challenging question. Um, but it's it's rooted in the the ethos and um, what, how we live our lives within the corporate world, at least at the CADA certainly, where we we have a an acronym we say P T R B, and P stands for patient, T stands for trust, R stands for reputation, and B stands for business, and we're driven in that order. So we put the patient first in everything we do. We want that the society have trust in us and us to be have a great reputation in the in the business and the industry last but not least obviously we're a pharmaceutical company we're a for-profit organization you know we need to satisfy our shareholders needs but as we think about which diseases we intend to tackle we say let's put the patient at the center how can we with our technologies and our techniques and our skills develop medicines that will truly transform how a patient's life is carried out. And so we put that first. Of course, we have to consider, you know, the business aspects. So there is always going to be a pressure for where do you put your resources? And it's a constant, I would say, pressure between um, the R&D organization and the the commercial part of the organization. Uh, Because obviously, you know, we, we can look at large prevalence diseases and say, if we capture and we develop, you know, transformative medicines for those, obviously the returns to shareholders and to Decada are quite a bit larger than what it might be for a small disease. Um, but I do say when we when we choose the disease we work on, it first and foremost comes to, do we think that we can actually dramatically impact a patient's life through the medicines that we discover and develop? I think that's tremendously important for folks to hear. I think there's a lot of confusion about our industry. And when the industry does well, and I've been at this for a very long time, uh, when the industry does well, it's because we focus on the patient. And when we've done things that disappoint me, at least, and many others, I think we lose sight of the patients in the service of dollars. And over my career, I've when I first came into the industry, we rarely... I mean, people didn't want to mention the patient. And I've seen over the years the evolution to a perspective that's much closer to, to the correct one, which is we're a special industry. We have a special obligation and and patients have to come first. I'm delighted to hear that that's the, that's the aphorism or, what, what, or your, your code for that kind of thinking. And I, I think people in our audience will very much appreciate hearing that. And and it's the right way to do things. I think we all agree on that. Yeah. So uh, to stay on the theme of economics, <laughs> I, th- I think most people think that the price of rare d- disease drugs is too high and going to have to come down. Uh, I guess first thing to ask is, do you see it that way? And the second is, if that actually happens, what does that do to you? Yeah, yeah. So... Uh... I completely agree. The price of rare disease drugs is too high. They, they will have to come down. There, there's no doubt about it. The pressure though, obviously, as we think about developing drugs or medicines for patients with maybe a few hundred individuals, I mean, obviously you work in nano rare, so even fewer, is that there has to be at least some potential return that 
a company our size can, can see in order to justify the investment. What we're doing, at least at Decada, is to try to be more efficient with our discovery and our development. And we need to look to the regulators, to public policymakers, to help us in this journey. Because the only way that the price of rare disease medicines will come down is if we can be more efficient and more effective at discovering and developing them. And if we have an opportunity to get these therapies on the market sooner than what would be typically be a normal development cycle for, for a rare disease medicine. And it's obviously a very com complex topic, right? Because people don't, you know, they see the price and they get sticker shock. Quite frankly, I see the price and I get sticker shock. But what isn't seen by people is obviously all the failures and all the money that goes in to essentially you know, drilling, I'll call it dry holes, right? These medicines that don't succeed are not effective and or safe. And uh, it's, you know, it's, a, it's obviously a challenging business. Our, our, uh, my, my boss, Andy Plump, who runs the R&D organization, is fond of saying that um, developing medicines is not rocket science. It's actually harder. Oh, it's, uh, oh, it's harder. I think he's right. <laughs> Oh, he's uh, he's right. I've I've said for many many decades that I've only encountered two things that are actually hard in my life, uh, and both of them were dismissed by people who never have done them. One is being a good parent; that's hopeless. You're always going to end up a failure. And the second is making a drug. And it in and you hear people who've never had children, never ever dreamt of trying to make a drug, and describe, oh well, it's easy. Yeah, <laughs> it drives me nuts, <laughs> but it does to you. <laughs> It oh, really well. <laughs> I, I've, I've failed at both on many, many occasions. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, and I've had more opportunity to fail in drugs than I've had in my in sons. But <laughs> anyway, that's good too. Uh, so anyway, we better get back on track here. Um, yeah, what a goof. Um, anyway, I think um, I see often. Uh, um, that a rare disease effort, especially a genetically based rare disease effort, is is conjoined with hematology. And uh, I think it'd be interesting for our, our, our audience to hear why that makes sense. Yeah, it's, um, well, I mean, in, in one sense, it's perhaps the easiest, I'll call it organ of the body, of the body to reach, right? Because we have coursing through our veins and arteries every day, you know, billions and billions of, of cells. And, and as we think about, um, you know, the, I'll say the more prevalent rare diseases within the hematologic landscape, there's also been an opportunity with the advent of cell therapy and gene therapy, a true opportunity a, a conjoined with the use of bone marrow transplantation to truly transform how we think about hematologic based rare diseases. It, we, we're beginning to see obviously now these coming to, to the marketplace for hemophilia A, for hemophilia B. And these are you know, truly, I'll call them first generation programs, but they have monumental impact on the patients who are able to receive them. Um, you know, going back to your price and economics question, I mean, the key here is to try to get the price of these therapies down so that they can be much more widely available than they have, have been. But you know, I think um, it's to me, it's the, kind of the best perhaps testing ground for some of these new technology platforms like gene and cell therapy. Um, because you can quickly see whether you're actually having an impact on these disease states, which is very important. As you know, in, in drug development, we really want to understand, are we able to actually have the, you know, hit the biomarker as a reduce of toxic biomarker or, or change a symptom quickly so we know that our drug is actually effective. And we know we have to do the hard work of obviously going through and, and demonstrating clinical benefit. But it's, um, in many ways, hematology is a, is a great space to start testing these therapies. These new therapies. Yeah, I mean, the opportunity to get an early read on whether you have a chance to succeed is so extraordinarily important. And I, I think that's one of the advantage, the multiple advantages of genetically based drugs, right? Because you know the cause of the disease when you begin, or you think you do anyway. And, and if you can get an early read, generally, um, your phase three results are going to turn out to be similar, not the same, but generally similar. And that allows you to then justify greater spending, which is the inevitable next step is to spend a lot more money, right? Yeah, no, it's, that's exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. right. So uh, in your job every day, 
um, <laughs> what it, what is it that you enjoy? What do you what do you look forward to? Um, we, yeah. I won't ask you what you hate because that probably would make you a little uncomfortable. But yeah. uh, at least focusing on what makes you happy. Well, I, I what I love is um, working with a tremendous group of committed people who have the same ambition and the same desire that I do, which is to try to bring forward medicines that are going to transform people's lives. And so I get to work with such an amazing group of individuals that span an ent oh, entire spectrum of backgrounds. Uh, you know, everything from chemists to biologists to molecular biologists to virologists. I mean, it's just amazing the, the type of individuals that I get to interact with on a daily basis, both within the company and then of course, external to the company. Uh, through collaborations. So that that's probably the biggest joy that I have every day. The second joy is that, you know, I in rare diseases, obviously there are 8,000 and counting, right? So I I literally learn something new every day. And, you know, I, I'm a son of two educators. My father's a professor, my mother's a teacher. And so they instilled in me a love of, of learning. And not only do I get to do a job that I love, but I I learn every day. The beauty of science and medicine, huh? It's fantastic, right? It's just fantastic. So. Yeah, no. Um, there's nothing that compares. It's just nothing that I know of anyway. Other than being 6'8 and playing basketball, maybe. But we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll ignore that opportunity. Well, um, I, uh, I know you um, went... Uh, to King's College in, in the UK for your undergraduate and then Penn for your MD and house staff training and so on, uh, which, which, of course, is a very um, high quality young uh, process to get to where you are. Uh, why don't you fill in the blanks for us and how you came to be in this job? And, and, uh, and you know, again, I think the joy of that the job you have speaks for itself, but not everybody gets there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I must say that I, I wish I could say I planned this all out, <laughs> but when I was in, when I was in my twenties, I thought I was going to be a, you know, an academic cardiologist and would be seeing patients and, and publishing. Uh, and then I, you know, I just decided that I could do more. And I looked to the pharmaceutical industry to say, look, you know, I, I figured I would probably see five, six, maybe 7,000 patients in, in a career as a cardiologist and why I could have a very, very immediate impact on their lives. It, I, wanted, I wanted to do more. And, and so when I looked at the industry, our industry, the pharmaceutical industry, I said, you know, we can actually change the lives of thousands or even hundreds of thousands, even millions of people if we develop transformative therapies. And I was just so attracted to that, um, that vision that I, I joined industry really kind of almost on a, threw away my you know, promising medical career and went into industry. And I've had a variety of roles and, and it really has been, the pharmaceutical industry has been a wonderful playground for me because I've had an opportunity to work with just amazing people. I've spent time run, running development projects. I've spent time in business development, strategic corporate strategy. Uh, most recently, prior to my, my current role, I set up a group which was focused on venture investments and business development, doing collaborations with external companies, biotech companies, uh, other pharmaceutical companies, academics. Uh, and then I came to rare diseases for a little over four and a half years ago now, um, when Takeda and Shire came together. And I had the opportunity, you know, thanks to, to a, a wonderful mentor and, and my, my current boss, Andy Plump, to you know, lead the rare disease development efforts. And so I've been doing this now for almost, yeah, about four and a half years. Uh, mm -hmm. And I must say, it's, this has been the most fun four and a half years of my entire professional career, having an opportunity yeah. to work in rare diseases. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't really want to do NLORM at this stage in my career, but I'm so privileged to have, have had the opportunity to do it. And I, I think that's something people need to hear too. And, you know, I've talked to lots of people, especially since I started in Lorem, and, you know, this um, this thought process that leads to a decision to go into the industry, how often it sounds similar to uh, to what I did in, at a time when no one like me went to the industry. And, again, it's about leverage to do good. 
And if, you know, I, I reasoned that if I could make one decent drug, I would do more good than I could do um, with, for, with the rest of my life. And, uh, and, and I think that's a fairly common uh, justification or reason that people go to the industry. Uh, and and it's, it's wonderful to hear. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's the power that you have just de developing a single medicine, right? It can ch change yeah. the lives of thousands and thousands of individuals. So. And, you know, at Enlorem, we get to do that, but on a scale where we can know the patient, because most of them unblind us on the internet, and we can and we can feel when we succeed, and, and and there's no abstraction to it; it's tangible. And that brings me to to a question, probably will get us close to the end. Kate has been a solid supporter of Enlorem, and I talked to you early on when you'd just taken your job or just a little while. And uh, and 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 Takeda has been um, a supporter um, for for a while, and of course that's taking money that could be turned into profit and and using it to help patients. And I just wonder how all that that decision to help in Lorem came about, and um, and then how much more money I can ask for. <laughs> it's you, a trick you question. Can, yeah, you can. You can ask then. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yeah, uh, no, I, well, you know, I think I think Anne Lorm. First of all, you know, congratulations. You know, Anne Lorm has been just a tremendous, tremendous boon. I think to the rare disease community writ large, because fundamentally, you know, we in the pharmaceutical industry, we we can't work on diseases that affect just a small handful of, of individuals. It's just we're, we're we're at such a scale, at such a you know demand for resources that we just we just can't work on in areas where we only have a few pa you know a few patients and it, nor would it make sense for us to do it because we're not we're too, we're too big we're not nimble enough um and i don't want to you know take away from my from my team but it is it is challenging right it's 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 enormously challenging so and lorem has filled a huge huge gap and a need and we all and all of us who work in rare disease recognize that with the technologies that are available today, there are absolutely opportunities to bring transformative medicines to patients, to a few patients who have a particular disease. And it's just been fascinating and captivating watching the progress that you, you've made. So, you know, congratulations, because it's um, it's absolutely needy. And, you know, we're all in this, we're all in this together. I, I know that some of the issues that Enlorm has dealt with, you know, we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of trying to come up with endpoints that we believe are going to be both you know meaningful to the patient as well as pass regulatory scrutiny so that they'll, they'll be allowed to essentially be approved to be used in, for therapies. And I think it's um, you know it's fantastic the way that you're leading because I think as regulators get more and more used to saying, okay, I, I, I can look and I can understand how a disease progresses and how a drug can help a few patients. That helps all of us in the rare disease industry because we're all saying the same thing, which is, you know, we need to get these medicines to patients as quickly as possible, but ensure that they're safe and effective. I mean, we all we all wish to do the same thing. I think, you know, the regulators, industry. Um, so it's, you know, it's it's a journey, right? It's it's absolutely a journey that we'll need to continue. Well, thank you for all those kind words. And you know, one of the things that's remarkable about this is the part is is the response of the FDA to the idea. I, you know, proposed all this in 2019 to the senior folks in in the drug division and was not optimistic. Uh, and uh, I, I think what's happening within Lorem and the nanorare patients and regulators um, should serve as a really great model for how um, different organizations with different missions can come together with one, one goal: help as many patients as we can, and and um, and that itself, just that, is a gratifying step forward. I think for for all of us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one one thing we should try to th do as an industry too is to try to help with um, the early diagnostic and this diagnostic dilemma that we you know we speak about again and again and again. And I wonder if we can partner with you know regulatory authorities on. On that aspect as well, you've seen it in spades, right? Yes. 
you know, uh, most of our, the vast majority of our patients are never diagnosed. And, and the average, I'm writing the first pa- the, uh, uh, a, a paper uh, about the first 173 applications we processed. It's fascinating. We're learning things that I think will change our perception of health and disease altogether, which itself is a reason to do this. But the, the working model of NLORM and the FDA is a model to look at and, and one that I think should be exportable and, and, and enlargeable for well-meaning uh, people to come together and work in a more effective way for our patients. I hope so. And, yeah. and I completely agree that the most urgent reform needed is to in- institute genomic sequencing into newborn evaluation protocols with, with appropriate controls, of course. And I, you know, and I think we all, and all of us who know this and, and believe it, will uh, need to come together and and make that happen sooner rather than later. And and treatment is always the sharp end of the spear, right? It's what gets people's attention. So I'm hoping and Lauren can help with that. That would be that would be great. You know, I mean, yeah. obviously, you know, some of the work that Stephen Kingsmore is doing and others, it's, you know, it's phenomenal. It's, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. And it's important. It's incredibly important for us to help support efforts to do early diagnosis uh, it's as you said through genetics sequencing i mean these tools are available it's not it's not a lack of tools it's it's a lack of sort of an ability to to speak with insurance companies and and physicians to try to say how do we actually implement these at yeah. scale so that we can really understand the gen- underpinnings genetic underpinnings of the disease yeah i think it's high on all of our agendas and so, Dan, I really have enjoyed this conversation. It's nice to get to know you a little better. Have a, is there a question I haven't asked that uh, you'd like uh, to answer? Uh, I think, you know, maybe not a question, but you said, what's the fun part of my day? You know, I think the other aspect of, of this is, you know, most most of the pharmaceutical drug development, you you work with called nameless and faceless patients. And in rare disease that, as you know, is not the case. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a very interesting, I'll say dialogue that occurs between the treating physician, the patients and families who have the disease and the companies who are trying to develop medicines. That, that was probably the most surprising thing, thing to me. You know, and obviously there has to be privacy, but um, you really, you get to know the individuals, the physicians who are taking care of these patients. And in some cases, you get to know the patients and their families as well, which, um, which is also incredibly gratifying too. Yeah. For me, it's been like returning to the practice of medicine, which I still miss after all these years. It's, you know, practice of medicine can get pretty boring, but, but the opportunity to touch someone and, and have that be helpful is is something I st- still very much miss. And I'm getting a bit of it in Enlorm. I recommend it to everybody. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Dan, thank you very much. And I appreciate your commitment to, to, to don- donate many more dedicated dollars to us. And I'll be over to see you and Andy pretty soon, okay? <laughs> that sounds great, Stan. Yeah, okay. no, thanks. Keep, keep up the great work. It's fantastic to see what's, and how Enlorm has grown and just made such an impact. So, Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. And Lorem is a nonprofit committed to discovering and providing personalized experimental treatments for free for life to patients with genetic diseases that affect 1 to 30 patients worldwide, referred to by Enlorum as nano rare. Many of these patients progress and die without ever achieving a diagnosis. This is where Enlorum comes in. They do the impossible by providing hope and for those that they can help free lifetime treatment. For more information about Enlorum or today's episode, visit enlorum.org. Any questions can be sent into podcast at enlorum.org. Search Enlorum on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook to connect with us. This video is hosted by Dr. Stan Crook and produced with the help of the following professionals. Thank you for watching.